for the social policy studies. And I'm very pleased to moderate today's talk organized by the Strategic Studies Unit here at the Arab Center on the future of Gaza. Uh, as the Israeli military campaign enters its uh, fifth month, Palestinians continue to count the dead and mass destruction. The Israeli campaign has killed nearly 30,000 of Palestinians, forced nearly 85% of Gazans out of their homes and destroyed most of Gaza creating one of the biggest humanitarian disasters of our time. Um, the criminal, the International um, Court of Justice decided that genocide is plausible while trapped Palestinians fear another Nakba. So how might the war play out? What might be the future or might, what might the future hold and how will the effect, this affect the Palestinian cause in the years to come? To reflect on these questions, we are very pleased to host a distinguished guest, Rex Bryan, a professor of political science at the McGill University in Montreal. He specializes in political development, peace building, humanitarian assistance and reconstruction, urban and irregular warfare, and intelligence analysis. Professor Bryan has worked as a consultant for several governments, media, United Nations agencies, and the World Bank. He's the author or editor of six books on various aspects of the Palestinian issue, including a book titled Sanctuary and Survival, the PLO in Lebanon, another book titled Very Political uh, Economy, Peace Building and Foreign Aid in the West Bank and Gaza, published in 2000, and the Palestinian refugee problem, the search for a resolution, published in 2013. Professor Brynan, the floor is yours for around 30 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here speaking virtually at the Doha Institute, but given the death and destruction we see in Gaza, I'd much rather that this we didn't we didn't have this to this sad situation to uh, to talk about. Um, there has been much speculation about what happens the day after in Gaza and what political security, humanitarian, social and economic conditions look like when the current war ends. Um, as I will state my talk today, I don't think that a clear and definitive day after is the most likely outcome of certain current circumstances. Um, instead, I think we're headed towards something that will look like a cross between Lebanon, between Israel's 1982 invasion and its 2000 withdrawal, and Somalia, where there has never been full stability or, or reconstruction after decades of civil war, or possibly northern Syria. Despite widespread recognition that the events of the past four and a half months are rooted in the unresolved Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands and denial of Palestinian rights of self-determination, despite all the references we hear now about the need to reinvigorate the, a peace process, a two-state solution, I am deeply pessimistic that any fundamental progress is going to be likely in the immediate years ahead. Um, to, to make that argument, I will discuss briefly the current situation, which I think most of you are, are following closely and, and will already know. I'll talk about scenarios for the coming months, although a lot of that will depend on the, the, the current hostage and ceasefire negotiations. I'll talk about possible long-term futures, and then we can throw it up for a, a, broader, a broader discussion. Um, as was said in the introduction, I variously worked on Palestinian politics, on development assistance uh, and humanitarian emergencies, on urban and irregular warfare, all of those things coming together tragically in the in the current case of, of Gaza. Um, I've also done work on forecasting and intelligence assessment. And one absolutely fundamental finding of the research in this area is that if you cling strongly to prior assumptions and see the world through the lens of your political preferences, you are much more likely to be wrong about what will happen than if you, if you don't do that and if you maintain a sort of objective stance. Consequently, 
what I want to say at the outset is that nothing I say today should be taken as what I want to happen. Um, instead, it's a rather dispassionate and, as I say, somewhat depressing assessment of someone who's worked on the region for a long time of what I think is most likely to happen. And indeed, I very much hope that I am, I am wrong about what I'm going to say. Now, as you know, as, as was said in the introduction, the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza is currently reporting almost 30,000 Palestinians have been killed there since October 7th. While Israel has contested that number, I, I think for a variety of reasons we can discuss, it's likely to be accurate. Indeed, I think it is an undercount because it only includes recovered bodies, as the Ministry of Health has made clear. It doesn't include bodies that are still in the rubble. It doesn't include bodies that are recovered by Israeli forces. I think the actual number is thousands higher, um, at least 35,000, and I would not be surprised if the current number were closer to 40,000. I would assess, and this is another contentious issue, that around 70 to 75 percent of the deaths we've seen so far in Gaza are civilian deaths. 1.7 million uh, people have been forcibly displaced. Most of them have no home to return to, and almost everyone in Gaza is currently food insecure as, the, as Gaza teeters on the edge of full-fledged famine. The World Bank did a report in late January, and part of that report assessed on the basis of satellite overhead imagery that 57% of all water and sanitation facilities in Gaza had been damaged or destroyed, 62% of housing, 77% of municipal service infrastructure, 83% of education infrastructure, and 84% of health infrastructure had been damaged or destroyed. Of the housing infrastructure that had been damaged or destroyed, most of it had been destroyed beyond repair. That is, it couldn't be repaired again. Um, I have a few slides I'll, I'll quickly show, which sort of run through all of that. You've probably seen this data before. Uh, data on fatalities, data on forced displacement, data on food insecurity, um, on casualties, on the damage that has been done on UN staff who have died the most in any conflict in the history of, of uh, UN involvement in humanitarian emergencies in conflict zones, the small number of trucks that are reaching into, into Gaza each year, uh, averaging less than 100 through the, the course of the conflict, Gaza normally would receive 500 trucks of supplies a day. And that's when its agricultural production was working, since Gaza produces a significant share of its food and is currently producing none of its own food. This, however, was the graphic I particularly wanted to show. This is the World Bank's assessment of infrastructure damage by sector, the numbers I just gave you, and you can see them creeping up and up and up, and they will continue to creep up as long as the, the fighting uh, continues. On the right, UN satellite imagery on damage that's being done to the Gaza Strip. And on the left, although that's a few days old now, um, an, an estimate of current Israeli military positions in blue, what Israel currently holds, um, most of Gaza City, most of Khan Yunus, but of course a major assault on Rafah uh, yet, yet to occur. Now, it has to be said at the outset that urban warfare in general is enormously destructive. We saw this during the successful Iraqi campaign to liberate Mosul in 2017. That left perhaps 10,000 Iraqi civilians dead over four months of fighting and saw 138,000 houses damaged or destroyed. But the level of destruction in Gaza is worse in several respects. It's worse because of the overwhelming firepower being used, and in many cases, the lack of discrimination of, in its use. It's worse because the displaced have nowhere safe to go, because all commercial activity, all importation of critical supplies has been stopped, and because inadequate humanitarian assistance is, really, is reaching the affected population even after they've displaced, although almost the entire population of Gaza is located less than an hour from an international border uh, where there is infinite amounts of, of food and medicine available, essentially. And that's unparalleled in, in modern warfare. 
to have so much so close unable to reach so many people. A recent report by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the John Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health estimates that even if there were an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, a further six and a half thousand deaths would occur as a consequence of poor medical conditions, injuries already received, and the near apocalyptic destruction that the Israeli Defense Forces have wrought in the Gaza Strip. That same study estimates that if we do not get a ceasefire, and indeed if things get worse with a, a full-scale assault on Rafa, between now and August, there will be between 58,000 and 74,000 additional deaths in the Gaza Strip, bringing us perhaps over 100,000 in the absence of, of a ceasefire. Now, I, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the pictures and you've seen the statistics, but this level of displacement and destruction of infrastructure is critical, not just for the immediate humanitarian situation, but also for the medium and long-term fate of Gaza. Um, Gaza is no longer a functioning economy and uh, it is no longer able to support itself. And it wasn't able to do so before October 7th. It was still heavily dependent on humanitarian assistance. Um, Politically, I would argue there are relatively few constraints on Israeli actions. In fact, I think Israeli actions are largely driven by domestic political considerations and international considerations, including even the United States, are relatively secondary. The Biden administration, although increasingly critical of aspects of Israeli military action, has only sought to moderate it, not to halt it. That has hurt the Biden administration in some quarters of the Democratic Party, although Americans remain split on the issue. There's, there's certainly no fundamental shift in, in US public opinion, uh, just, I would argue, relatively limited shifts. US efforts are almost entirely focused on discouraging a full-scale Israeli attack on Rafa, securing a hostage deal that would see the staged release of hostages and prisoners in exchange for temporary ceasefires, and various moves on aid and possibly redeployment of Israeli forces. This is all supposed to be accompanied by a series of temporary ceasefires, which I think Washington hopes will settle into some kind of loose permanency or at least change the character of the fighting, but does not seem to be a recipe for the permanent ending of all military hostilities in the Gaza Strip. And Israel, and it's important to look at Israel, because as I said before, I think this is the major driver of Israeli behavior, is Israeli politics. There is obviously strong criticism of the Netanyahu government for both the security failures of October 7th and its handling of the hostage issue. However, support for the war remains substantial. Even though a large proportion of the Israeli public does not believe the rhetoric about total victory in Gaza that Netanyahu um, pronounces, there is nonetheless strong support for military action in Gaza. According to recent polling, two-thirds of Israeli Jews, uh, obviously uh, uh, Israeli Arabs or Palestinians in, in, in Israel have different views, uh, believe that intensive fighting should continue to force the relief of hostages. Three quarters believe that Israel should reject any U.S. pressure to moderate its military actions. A majority opposes a broad political deal to permanently end the fighting and opposes humanitarian assistance. Over 80%, according to surveys, believe that the suffering of Palestinian civilians in Gaza should only be a minor consideration in the conduct of the military campaign. Um, back in 2016, the International Committee of the Red Cross did a study on attitudes to humanitarian law in conflict areas around the world. Um, and it was noteworthy back in 2016 that it, that Israelis professed less respect for international humanitarian law than almost all, any other uh, population that was polled in conflict areas. It also has to be said, by the way, that Palestinians uh, also figured very low in respect for international humanitarian law. It's always been a bit of an outlier in terms of the data on respect for international humanitarian law. From a narrowly military point of view, not the broader politics, from a narrowly military point of view, the Israeli Defense Forces are likely satisfied with the way the military campaign has unfolded. In other words, Israel's not feeling any particular military pressure 
Uh, the IDF has lost 240 personnel since October 7th, that is say not including those that were lost on October 7th, which is an extremely low number for a sustained urban campaign. It's less than half of what the IDF lost in the 1982 invasion of Lebanon and siege of Beirut. And those low Israeli military casualties are due in large part due to the heavy use of airstrikes and artillery the very thing that has generated so many civilian casualties and so much damage to infrastructure. So there's little incentive in the Israeli military to change what it's doing because what it's doing is keeping its casualties relatively low. Moreover, I would assess that, that many or most IDF personnel are still enraged by October 7th and frankly, at a personal level, don't much care what happens to Palestinian civilians in Gaza. And when that attitude is widespread across the military, war crimes and crimes against humanity become the almost inevitable result. Politically, Benjamin Netanyahu has an interest in the continuation of the war rather than definitively ending it because it postpones his day of political reckoning and he will do anything to try and maintain his hold on political power. Now, none of that precludes the possibility of a hostage deal. Obviously there are intense negotiations about that right now. It, it could be, I had to check the news this morning to make sure it hadn't happened. Uh, we could at any day hear that there's a hostage deal and a, and a temporary ceasefire with all kinds of linkages about how the ceasefire continues as hostages and prisoners are released and other things will occur. Um, certainly the US is pushing for that. It recognizes how politically damaging a major Israeli assault on, on Rafa would be. And Hamas I think is nervous about that too. But given what I've said, and this is a critical point, I think any such agreement will simply lead us to a reduced level of violence and not a definitive ending of the fighting in Gaza. I think there's a likelihood of possible ceasefire breakdowns, even if there's an agreement, whether due to bad faith or misunderstanding or accident. I think that Israel and Netanyahu said this yesterday, will continue military action in Gaza once the final temporary ceasefire expires, somewhat akin to Israeli military action in southern Lebanon in the 1970s. When it sees targets, it will strike them regardless. It will continue to raise, to destroy, to flatten border areas, which is what it's doing right now. It will continue to demolish civilian infrastructure. It will continue to divide Gaza into zones of Israeli control, checkpoints, barriers to movement, coupled with extensive population controls. And we've already seen that in terms of the biometric data that has been collected by Palestinians who who are within or who pass through Israeli military positions. I do not think there will be a substantial return of Palestinians to northern Gaza. I think Israel would like to depopulate northern Gaza for its own security reasons. It will not uh, encourage or permit uh, Palestinians to return. And even if it does in some numbers, conditions there will be so difficult to sustain life that there won't be any mass return to northern Gaza. I think that UNRWA will, because we obviously see a major Israeli campaign against UNRWA, will not be permitted to work in Israeli controlled areas at all in Gaza. So in northern Gaza, UNRWA will cease to be a primary provider of services over time. Um, last week, of course, the Netanyahu government unveiled its own plan for the days after for the medium term future of Gaza, which explicitly called for ongoing security control, which is, of course, just another word for occupation, for demilitarization, which in context means continued idea military action from time to time, and for limited civil administration in conjunction with locals who are neither Hamas nor PA. Um, uh, that is to say, whoever Israel can co-opt or pressure or force into limited local cooperation. Now, writing in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz yesterday, uh, journalist Elon Pinkas said that Netanyahu's day after plan was neither feasible nor a plan, neither feasible nor a plan. And I think he's right, except for I think that's what they'll do. Um, in other words, I think it's deeply flawed in many, many respects. And nonetheless, I think it is probably a fairly accurate outline of what Israel tends to do. Now, 
I think it's important to recognize that Israel has never since October 7th had a coherent or thoughtful plan for what would happen in Gaza. It has more or less made it up as it went along with different members of the Israeli cabinet having different agendas and different views on what should happen. They has stumbled and fumbled its way through it driven by the right-wing ideology of the current Israeli government and anger over October 7th. Um, and I think that's it will continue to do that. It did much the same in Lebanon in 1982, where there was never really a coherent plan, and Israel stumbled into 18 years of occupation of, of southern Lebanon. Indeed, in many ways, it did that after 1967, where it had no absolutely clear vision at the outset of what it was going to do with the West Bank and walked its way into mass settlement activity and an intensified occupation, creeping annexation and, and de facto apartheid. Um, I think if there is a ceasefire, um, it will, or temporary ceasefires followed by a resumption of a lower level of violence, that will provide some limited respite in terms of humanitarian conditions. Um, uh, so the, that that in itself is important. But I do not believe, as someone who's worked extensively on, on development in the Palestinian territories, I do not believe there will be any reconstruction of Gaza uh, for years and years and years. Um, I, I think we will get we will simply get the band-aid of humanitarian assistance and Gazans doing whatever they can to try and improve or safeguard the situation of the, those that are close to them. Um, as I said, Israel has no interest in the return of Palestinians to Gaza City, to northern Gaza. I think U.S. leverage is weak and in any case ineffectively applied under the Biden administration, which has more or less agreed with Israel's um, uh, carrying out a major campaign against Hamas in Gaza. A Trump administration, if that's what follows the Biden administration, at the moment I think that's better than 50-50 chance it will, simply will not care what Israel does in the Palestinian territories. It simply will not be a major concern one way or other, I think, of the, the Trump administration. They'll be a little bit influenced by Israel. They'll be a little bit influenced by the Gulf, but their general policy will certainly not be one of concern for any kind of humanitarian or international law considerations. European leverage is still weaker, and Europe has other things to deal with, including a war in Ukraine that's that's perhaps not going as well as they would have hoped a year ago. Um, Israel will increasingly target UNRWA and others. We already see them refusing to provide longer term visas for virtually all humanitarian staff working in the West Bank, as well as their their restrictions in, in Gaza. I do not believe Israel will permit substantial building materials into Gaza, which are essential for any kind of reconstruction. I don't think it will permit substantial commercial traffic. Um, I don't think that Israel will ever again become, or at least not ever again, for years will not become the major artery for any commercial goods going into Gaza. Uh, they will try to throw the entire issue into Egypt's lap. Egypt will be unwilling to assume this responsibility. And there's also a significant chance that creeping Israeli military, either a full-scale assault on Rafah or creeping Israeli military activities after ceasefires will leave Israel um, in a position where it has seized all or most of the border crossing uh, with Egypt anyway, the Philadelphia uh, corridor. There will be no effective governance in Israeli controlled areas. There will be at best a patchwork of limited local arrangements with technocrats, with local leaders, with with Hamula, with clan leaders and so forth. Israel will not assume, unlike 1967, I do not believe Israel will assume the responsibilities of an occupying power. Instead, it will undertake counterinsurgency actions and security actions in a quasi-apocalyptic context uh, with, uh, with no effective Palestinian governance of any sort um, or a patchwork quilt of local arrangements. Now, tragically, um, that's the more optimistic of my assessments. Um, a pessimistic ass uh, assessment would see the failure of the hostage and ceasefire talks entirely, uh, continued major IDF ground campaigns in Gaza, including into Rafah, uh, and perhaps at some point, large numbers of desperate Palestinians breaching the border to flee into Egypt, 
regardless of Egyptian warnings that that would be a red line at a certain point, you just can't stop it. If people want to cross the, bre the border, they can ultimately breach it, which is why Egypt is busy constructing refugee camps on the Egyptian side of the border, even as it says it won't permit the forced displacement of Palestinians out of Gaza. And there, there is our, 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 our second Nakba. That's the, the, the short to medium term. In the longer term, October 7th has had the tragically paradoxical consequence of renewing international attention to the importance of the Palestinian issue whilst making it much, much harder to resolve. Support in Israel for a two-state solution has largely collapsed. Um, and the likelihood of a one-state solution, I think, is, is even more remote. While Netanyahu's days are numbered, he's deeply unpopular, and at some point he will face electoral accountability. Um, the next Israeli election, whenever it occurs, is likely more, much more likely to see a shift to the right in Israel than a shift to the left. Now, uh, Hamas popularity, we don't, in, in Gaza, I think Hamas has significantly dented its popularity, but on the West Bank, it's grown substantially. We know that from the, the polling data, and it's grown at the expense of an already weak and widely disliked Palestinian authority. But October 7th is also assured that Hamas will not be considered a interlocutor for major political outcomes by almost anyone. In other words, the, the people won't deal with Hamas regardless of its growing strength in the West Bank. Um, it will deal with it on ceasefire issues. They'll deal with it on hostage issues, but in, in long term, longer term issues, I, I think it will be um, radioactive, impossible for the international community to deal with it, which it refused to do in the past, largely anyway. What do I think could be done about this? Um, there's a couple of former McGill students in the audience, including Professor Omar, and he will know I'm very opinionated. I've, I've got a view on everything. Um, I, I, I always like to think I know what, what might happen. I have no idea. I, I think for the first time in, in decades of thinking about the Palestinian issue, I am struggling for a way forward. I think there are things that could or might happen that would be somewhat useful. I think action at the ICC and the ICJ, at the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, particularly the ICJ advisory hearing on the occupation more broadly, I think those are useful and those may result in useful outcomes. I think uh, the potential recognition of a Palestinian state by the US and or the British, which both are now quietly talking about doing uh, before there's even a, a, a final status agreement. I think that that's somewhat useful. I'm rather doubtful it will happen on the US end. I'm a little more hopeful it could happen on the UK end. Um, possibly a United Nations Security Council resolution much later this year, outlining a path forward. That might be useful. Perhaps a new generation of Palestinian leadership, although I have no idea what that looks like, nor do I see any sign of it of emerging it would be useful. But I don't actually think any of that changes the fundamentals. I think the fundamentals will be widespread support in Israel for Israeli security control over most of Gaza, a draconian regime of population control in Gaza, coupled with no effective reconstruction and simply a population surviving on humanitarian assistance and continued lower levels of warfare in Gaza if we get ceasefire agreements or a major campaign continuing in Gaza if we don't. I think those, those are the, the fundamentals. Uh, and I think it will be enormously difficult to get any likely Israeli leader after Netanyahu to genuinely embark on the path of, of negotiations with the Palestinians leading to a Palestinian state. And I do not think it could be sold to the Israeli public right now anyway, because of the shock of October 7th. An explosion in the West Bank, a third intifada increasing the pressure on Israel. Um, I think that might have been more effective before October 7th. I think it would be much less effective October 7th. I think before October 7th, uh, widespread protests, uprisings, civil disobedience, violence in the West Bank might have sent the signal to Israel that occupation doesn't work. I think in the given the dynamics in Israeli society right now, it would be understood today as evidence that you needed 
firmer, harder occupation. Not that you needed less of it, but that you actually needed more of it. So as I said, um, it's a very pessimistic assumption of, of where we're headed. Um, there are a lot of really fundamental issues to be considered. There are difficult issues on the ground in Gaza will emerge on the extent to which one collaborates or cooperates or doesn't with Israel. Um, there's the critical question of whether we'll have forced displacement into Egypt. There's a question of whether the international community can do anything useful, uh, not just on the current fighting, but on, on longer term, longer term resolution. Um, uh, and there's the, the, the question too of, of simply providing humanitarian assistance for a population that is desperate at a time when the main humanitarian provider in Gaza is under attack, um, has lost half of its funding and will struggle to operate. And there I should just add that the consequences of this are not just the war in Gaza and not just the intensified violence we've seen in the West Bank, both before and even more so after October 7th, but the consequences for Palestinians in Lebanon and Syria in particular of a near collapse of UNRWA. Lebanon, of course, is suffering one of the worst economic declines in modern history. Palestinian refugees being particularly hard hit. Serious civil war has never fully ended. And so we have two other Palestinian populations under enormous pressure in difficult circumstances facing the partial collapse of UNRWA in the months and years ahead uh, because of the suspension of funding by the US and a number of other major donors. And there I will end it. And uh, I'm open for discussions or questions and so forth. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rex Brynan, for sharing with, with us your, your thoughts and your, your insight and the, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a picture that it's still unclear to many. And as you said, it's, it's still, um, although you shared lots of information on, on possible scenarios, uh, things are developing and anything can happen. So uh, as a takeaway, I, I think you, in, in general, you looked at uh, the, the, the picture as um, an optimistic uh, picture, and, and, and you gave also a, a pessimistic scenario. Although both a, a, of them a are... more pessimistic and a less pessimistic might be a, a better characterization. You know, yeah. Totally, totally. I so the, in 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 a pessimist in a, in an optimistic note, you would think that um, the the Israeli would would occupy uh, Gaza. And they would not allow the, the Palestinians, at least in the north of Gaza, which means that they would be stuck in the south near Rafah. And, uh, and also on the pessimistic note, you think that the Israeli operation, military operation might force uh, Palestinians out of Gaza into um, Sinai, into Egypt. And you also think that Israel lacks um, a clear vision of, of its plan, of, of, of its uh, end game, if, if, if you wish. And here's why, uh, if, you, if you allow me to, to kick this, this uh, conversation by uh, disagreeing a little bit with you, because uh, many, uh, many analysts and observers have seen that from day one, after, right after the 7th of October attack, the, uh, the strategic aim of, of Israel was expressed first by the military spokesman, and uh, by Netanyahu, by directing the Palestinians towards the uh, Rafah crossing and asking them to go to Egypt, which means that the, the main goal of this operation might be actually the force transfer, which, which is quite uh, uh, logic uh, uh, in, in light of uh, the, the settler colonialism objectives of, of, uh, of Israel from, from the Nakba. So uh, I don't know uh, you thought about that, but before uh, going back to you, um, I would like to to go to Professor Omar Shur for his um, quick comment on on your uh, excellent talk. If you can unmute, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Brynan and uh, Professor Al Basri as well. It's. Uh... Um, it's a very pessimistic uh, picture, uh, I, and actually, mine are more like uh, questions than, than comments. Actually, to uh, to Professor Brynan. So the 
basically, so what I got is is seventh of October was Hamas's catastrophic success, catastrophic success, if you can put it this way. That that's if that's an uh, you know if you if you can comment. But does any of the the security? I know there's a lot of uh, security studies, irrelevant theories, and and mediocre theories, and etc. But any of the solid ones, like the the um, what is known sometimes as the the three P's, you know, the, or the four P's, the, the the pressure affecting the uh, the and the pressure and the propaganda, the military pressure and the propaganda affecting the public opinion, the public opinion affecting the politics, meaning the decision makers. And the uh, loss of exchange uh, ratios, uh, despite being you know the, the the big gap, but Israel is much more sensitive to losses than the Palestinian side. Uh, LER, the, the loss of uh, accuracy gradient. You're killing the wrong people, and uh, therefore making it easier to mobilize a new generation to to fight back. Um, any of that has any relevance to what we're seeing now, or like how, how do you do you assess any of that? Um, um, and then the, the Sorry, yeah. yeah well, and one, one last and final one is uh, so the, the, there are more rockets since the last since the first week of February. Actually, there are more rockets from Lebanon than from Gaza. So the, Gaza is clearly it, it is driven the the, the, cap the capability to strike uh, via indirect fires from Gaza is getting reduced. It's quite clearly whether in other areas in Gaza or in into Israel, uh, but it's rising from from Lebanon from the south. Um, and would that have any, at least, operational impact, if not uh, a strategic one? And so I'm, I'm. Let, let's start with the last issue first, because I'm, I'm. I didn't talk about Lebanon. I'm, I'm glad you raised it so that we can do so. Um, I think there has been an ongoing debate in Israel at the most senior level about the value of trying to de-escalate the northern border. Uh, versus the value of using this as an opportunity to go after Hezbollah once they feel reasonably secure in their military situation in Gaza. Um, and, and part of that gets gets framed in an entire Israeli lens of seeing everything through the lens of a supposedly existential Iranian threat of which Hezbollah and, and Hamas are all part of the same thing in, in this sort of it, this particular version of an Israeli strategic view. And, and I think that the chances of it, uh, and this is clearly something that worried the US extensively. I mean, it pulled a carrier away from the, the Lebanese coast at one point to signal that it was worried the Israelis might take advantage of the Gaza war to start a, a Lebanon war too. Um, I think currently that debate leans towards a preference for a quieter northern border on in Israel rather than than the launching of a of a full scale invasion of Lebanon. But I I think that's still an issue that could go either either way. Um, the the fighting on the northern border um, has so far been, um, although the number of rockets might be higher than coming out of Gaza, it is a tiny fraction of what a Lebanese war would look like. Um, unlike Hamas, which was hardly ever able to overwhelm the Iron Dome system, which defends Israel from, from indirect fire. Uh, Hezbollah absolutely has that capacity, uh, much longer range rockets, much more accurate rockets, much heavier payloads, and, and can do damage of an order of magnitude greater than, than Hamas rockets or Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets have ever been able, able to do. Um, so uh, I, 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 I am, somewhat less worried about the eruption of a major Lebanese war than I was, say, two months ago or three months ago. But there is always the possibility that the argument in Israel will win out, well, let's finish off all of our major threats. <laughs> uh, we'll do Gaza first. And then when we're OK there, we're already mobilized. We're already the international community is already angry with us. Let's let's go for for Lebanon next, which will be a much harder war. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I don't think the Israelis are particularly sensitive to casualties in Gaza, frankly, not after October 7th. Um, I don't think this is like any other uh, Gaza war. Um, I think, if anything, the casualties probably stiff and resolve at the moment. And in the IDF, they're looking at about a 40 to 1 exchange ratio. There's about 40 Hamas combatants dead for every IDF loss. And they're thinking, my goodness, that's good, because that's extraordinarily in, in its 
you know, certainly the Iraqis in the SDF didn't manage that in Mosul or Raqqa. The Russians didn't manage that in Mariupol. Um, that, is, that is extraordinarily good for urban combat, one of the best records ever. Um, so I don't think the IDF is particularly worried, although the operation has been going relatively slowly in the sense that they've only just occupied slightly over half of Gaza, although a larger proportion of its population centers so far. Um, in terms of IR and security theory, um, I think that this has highlighted the importance of domestic public opinion. I think that this war is in large part about Israeli anger and rage and threat perceptions, um, coupled with the kind of messianic right wing views of, of a number of people in the Israeli cabinet, uh, a point that no less a person than former Likud Prime Minister Uhud Olmert made in an op ed in Haaretz last week. In which he he said, you know, the, I, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but he essentially said these are all crazies and they want to drive out Palestinians and not just from Gaza, but from the West Bank too. Um, and that's the former Likud prime minister of of the country. So I think that domestic politics and ideology has been very important. I think October seventh triggered an existential fear that the Jewish population of Israel has because of histories of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And I think that that, that, that insecurity um, fear has always been in Israeli society and it's been triggered in really important ways by October 7th. Um, in no way is this really an existential war, but I think widely it's seen as an existential war in, in, in Israel. Um, I think U.S. policy sadly has a lot to do with Joe Biden and will have a lot to do with Donald Trump um, as well. And I can imagine different U.S. presidents having somewhat, not entirely different, but somewhat different policies in ways that that might have made a difference. So it's not a great war if you're an absolutely pure realist. In terms of military action generating anger and fury, which aids recruitment, well, we certainly see that in terms of the effect in the West Bank where Hamas received a 20% plus boost in, in popularity um, as a consequence of the war. We don't know in Gaza. <laughs> you, we can't do meaningful polling in Gaza. My, I think a lot of Gazans blame Hamas for this. They think it was foreseeable um, and uh, that uh, uh, they're playing with the lives of, of their children. Um, a lot of anger over other issues too, but it's very hard to gauge support. I'm not sure that's a major Israeli consideration. I, I think that they have shifted to a paradigm that you that uh, to, to put it bluntly, I think Israel has shifted to a paradigm where it views all Palestinians as hostile and therefore military force is the only thing that ultimately works. And you see this in the ridiculous lengths to which Israel goes to try to prevent the PA from having any role in Gaza. Right. Um, it not only views Hamas as existentially dangerous, but the Netanyahu government seems to view the PA as even more dangerous. Hence its tacit support for Hamas before October 7th. Um, uh, so I, I think we're in that paradigm and I think it will take a very long time. I think this is a deeply traumatic experience for Israel, obviously even more so for, for Palestinians. I think it will take a long time for Israel to emerge from that very defensive uh, mindset or reliance on on physical physical force. What I think we will see, I mean, Hamas will gradually collapse as an organized fighting force. And to some extent, we already see that. Uh, fighting will continue, but it will be small groups of individuals. Um, it will be hit and run, which is what most of it has been anyway. There haven't been many stand-up battles. Um, it will be sabotage um, and it will be sniping. Uh, we still see that in areas that Israel has supposedly already cleared that's going to be the model. And um, I think that the Israelis are okay with that. Um, and part of their response will be an accelerated version of what Sharon tried to do in Gaza in the early 1970s, which is, you know, bulldozing stuff, enclosing people in, in marked areas, massive population movements, uh, um, collective punishment. Um, mass arrests and so forth. Uh, ultimately, that may prove to be a very short-sighted strategy, but um, it wouldn't be the first time that Israeli governments have embarked on short-sighted strategy or or other governments too. We can consider the 
U.S. invasion of Iraq or the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, or the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, unfortunately, you know, the world is littered with people making major strategic mishaps. And I think, frankly, October 7th and its aftermath is a, is a case of both in Hamas have, uh, and Israel having, having done so. Thank you so much. Um, let's continue with the, the engaging the, the audience. We have a question from um, Karam Bahloul. He says that one thing you need to address is this question. How long can Hamas sustain its fighting and resistance? And how does this play um, as a factor into your analysis of the future? Um, I, As I said, I think that the scope of Hamas uh, military operations will decline steadily over time as they lose personnel, as they lose logistic support, as they, uh, and so forth. Um, I think that small scale activities can occur, can continue almost indefinitely. Um, I mean, for an extended period of time with, you know, occasional ambushes or improvised explosive devices, uh, sniping attacks and so forth. Um, I, but I'm not sure, I, I think that ends up becoming an argument on the Israeli side for continuing and intensifying the occupation. So we get to kind of, we go from the current larger fighting to something more like the more violent periods of the Second Intifada. Um, and I think that that can continue indefinitely. Um, the destruction in, in Gaza is immense, but the amount of small arms and ammunition floating around or hidden around is is much higher than we had in the territories during the during the second intifada uh, so I, I think that continued fighting can occur for a significant period of time um almost as i say indefinitely i think uh, but not large-scale organized resistance okay so in in other uh, way the uh this will not change the plans the uh or at least the, the foreseeable scenarios of occupation or forced transfer. But um, uh, I would like to go back to uh, an, another aspect of uh, developments, the, the recent developments in, in, in Gaza, uh, which has to do with the, the, the construction of the Nezarim Corridor, uh, which has cut um, Gaza from east to west. And the Israelis are saying that uh, basically this is for uh, controlling the, um, the operation in, in Gaza. But there are other readings of, of this um, this development. So how do you see it? How does it fit in your in your scenarios? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think absolutely. Of course, before um, uh, before Israeli disengagement, you you had much the same thing in Gaza, right? You had a, a string of settlements and checkpoints that went essentially through it at Wadi Gaza, which allowed the Israelis to block movement between North and South Gaza. Um, I think that what <laughs> Israel is doing, I think, it's very clear is they are going to divide Gaza into grids of checkpoints and population controls with permanent military positions. We'll leave aside the issue of whether there will be Israeli settlement. At the moment, I don't think so, but I can't rule that out in the next 10 years. But the reestablishment of permanent military positions to allow them to divide the Palestinian population into grids. And you will need permission to go from one place to another. Uh, that will be biometric data. There will be, you know, iris scans, facial recognition scans. Um, military age males, in particular, won't be able to move. Uh, there'll be very restricted movement. There will be a very sophisticated system of population control um, emerging, um, and I think that that will continue. I think that part. I think there's lots of reasons for the widespread demolition we see in Gaza, but I think that that's part of the reason too, is to simply cordon off areas of, of Palestinian population and be able to control movement between them as part of a longer term occupation strategy. So I, th I think that's that's very significant. Um, and I think that's been in, in likely almost from the beginning. I remember posting on social media about October 8th or 9th or 10th that I thought that's exactly what the Israelis were going to do. And I think, as you point out correctly, that's what we now see them doing. I think we also will see them expanding I, I think a critical question is whether they try to control the whole philadelphia corridor the entire border strip with egypt to be able to completely control movement in and out of egypt they've started advancing that way about the first half of that is relatively easy because it's unpopulated and then you hit 
roughest city and it becomes much more difficult. But that is a possibility too, that they will push through across the border all the way to, to the Mediterranean in order to completely control Gaza rather than relying on Egyptian border controls. Um, partly because I think they'd be worried about tunnels and smuggling and, and things. Okay, so let's move to another uh, question, a very relevant one from um, Samhuri, who says, given the massive scale of deliberate destruction in Gaza and your pessimistic yet realistic assessment of what the future will hold for this trip, his question is, um, is this the end of the Gaza Strip as we know it? Uh, it's so a tough I'm, question. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, as we know it, you know, the Gaza that I used to visit um, before the war, yes. I, I, I mean, what we've seen is the destruction of generations of infrastructure that's being built by Palestinians, being built by Gazans, being built with the assistance of international organizations, the UN, and so forth. I mean, it's not just buildings being destroyed, it's it's communities and infrastructures and systems that have taken decades to develop. Um, uh, and in that sense, it's like, you know, Aleppo or uh, parts of, of, of northern Syria where, you know, the devastation is just so intense that we've been thrown back a couple of generations. It's, it's, it's like Mariupol in, in, in the Ukraine. Um, so yes, in that sense. Um, I would not underestimate the ingenuity of Gazans or indeed any population in wars. I'm, I'm a, you know, as someone who does humanitarian assistance, I'm always struck by the resourcefulness of people as they try to survive and care for their families. And so Palestinian Gazas will, Palestinians in Gaza will do as they are right now, do what they can do to improve their situation. And in the longer term, that will become a kind of low level casual reconstruction, but it won't be the 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 Gaza of of before. Um, and I certainly sometimes when people talk about, well, peace will come and Hamas will be gone and maybe there'll be a new Palestinian administration and the international aid will flow in and we'll rebuild Gaza. I absolutely think that is complete and utter fantasy. I think that's complete and utter science fiction. The sheer cost of it is is unbelievable at a time when there's international aid budgets are stretched, when there are wars going on in in Ukraine and Sudan and elsewhere. Um, so I, you know, the the the, the Gaza the future won't be the Gaza that we've known in in Gaza. Uh, the the scars of that war will be there a very long time, you know, as as we see in other places that have been affected by intense conflict of this sort. Well, unfortunately, there are many people who would agree with you um, on the prospect of, of Gaza. And uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the difficulties in terms of re reconstruction, especially the, the, the lack of funding, but there's also the lack of political will. Uh, since you have worked um, for quite a long time with uh, many uh, UN agencies, the World Bank, and you, you know the multilateral uh, system. What do you make of the um, the total failure of this this uh, multilateral system, and even of the so-called uh, rules-based order that the US and some Western countries have been touting for quite a while? What do you make of it in, in terms of um, the current situation and, and the prospect of Gaza? Well, I mean, we've seen we've seen this most evidently in the failure of the Security Council to be able to pass a ceasefire resolution, you know, with with a lone U.S. veto on the on the last attempt. Um, ironically, one could debate whether that's a failure of the system. That's how the system was designed. There's a reason why the permanent five members have vetoes on the Security Council, and that is they wouldn't have joined the U.N. unless they had one. The system was designed to protect the interests of the United States, Britain, France. Russia and China. And from that point of view, it's functioning exactly as it was designed after after World War II. Um, in terms of international law, um, international law requires the will of countries to do something about it. And we don't see much, much evidence of that. Um, I think eventually we're going to get international criminal court indictments for individuals, but I would not be surprised if that is many years before it occurs. And I would not be surprised if that sparks political warfare over the international criminal court that could see its 
marginalization and and destruction. Um, I think this problem is not just the Western world, frankly. Uh, prior to October 7th, and indeed a contributing factor to it was the Arab world's rush to normalize with Israel without demanding um, compliance with, with international law. Uh, we see most of the world uh, perfectly willing to ignore Russian occupation of Ukraine to take another case of aggression and, and occupation. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think we have entered a period where international humanitarian law uh, and other aspects of international law are being, which were already weak, are being rapidly eroded. Um, but to put it another way, simply between Ukraine and Gaza, there's virtually not a country in the world um, that is not currently being hypocritical. They're being hypocritical on one or the other or both. Um, and so sadly, it's not even just the Western world. I mean, South Africans did terrific work on bringing the ICGA reference at the same time they've been complicit in possibly shipping military equipment to to. Uh, uh, to uh, Russia and were unwilling to enforce ICC prosecutions of senior Sudanese officials in the past. Okay. Uh, you know, in, India has been actually terrible on both conflicts. Brazil's been great on Gaza and terrible on Ukraine. Uh, the US has been actually good on Ukraine, but absolutely appalling on Gaza. So uh, it, it's much more widespread than just the Western countries. I think there's a general failure of the international community, all of whom only focus on international law when it seems to be to their advantage, which maybe realistic was realistically was always a, a case. Having said that, it's not unhelpful when the International Court of Justice offers uh, interim opinion on genocide or makes an advisory ruling on the legality of the occupation. It's not unhelpful when the ICC issues indictments, even if it takes forever to do so. So all of those things help, but to, to consider that they'll They'll, they'll be the framework within which states act, I think, sadly, has not proven to be the case at all. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to Professor Roman. I just have a, uh, it's more of an optimistic, it's, it's uh, optimistic hypothesis. I don't know, maybe you'll shatter it down, but just, uh, I agree totally with you on the double standard. There's been like, it has been horrible uh, on the, the two examples you've mentioned in terms of Ukraine and in terms of Gaza, you you, you saw, yeah, I, I don't need to repeat it. You just uh, summarized it so uh, uh, so well. But just one issue with Ukraine, I just came back from Irpin. Irpin was uh, like a, a couple of, a uh, few months ago. Irpin was 70% uh, destroyed. Um, the trauma is still there, but the town is new now. It's almost new. It, it had to do with a lot of work that the Ukrainians have done. But also they founded, uh, you know, within the, the, the stretched budget, mainly of the European Union and some of the, the, the Western partners. In terms of Gaza, I think they can fight some, some of these uh, stretched aid budgets in, in, the, uh, in the Arab world. I don't know if this, this uh, I mean, it, the Arab world does not destroy it. The Israelis did, but the Israelis won't, won't, won't pay for it. Um, so I don't know if this is, this is something, uh, an optimistic note or not, but I'll be... And then, and then one other bit I want to, to ask you about. Uh, have you seen any, because I, I, am, I am very confused on the military versus civilian casualties in terms of the, the Palestinians. Hamas doesn't, doesn't um, declare its, its losses. Um, so I've seen all types of figures. Uh, one to five, one, one militant for five civilians, one to ten. One, I, I saw like m multiple figures. So do, do you have any any... Any commentary on that? Or any credible estimates? So, so I, I think it's very hard. And in fact, at this point, I don't think Hamas even knows what its casualties are because I think it's lost communications with many of its brigades. So I'll talk about that and I'll talk about the reconstruction. Um, so the 29,000 number we know, uh, as I said before, is only recovered bodies. It doesn't include those that are not recovered. Uh, and the Ministry of Health used to say that a lot at the beginning. We think there's 8,000 people that we aren't accounted for, um, but they don't say the number. They don't give an estimate for that anymore. The U.S. itself has said we actually think the Ministry of Health number is too low. We think the actual number is, is higher. Um, and many of the Hamas dead are going to be dead in tunnels. They're not going to be recoverable bodies ever. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're underground and they're not going to get dug up. Um, 
the current U.S. estimate seems to be around 10,000 dead on the Hamas side. Uh, seems to be. You, you can never tell by selective leaks to the U.S. prestige press from the intelligence community. But let's take that as a reasonable number. Now, the 29,000, 30,000 Ministry of Health numbers, if you look at the demographic distribution, that is to say the proportion of military-aged males to women and children and old people, it is clear that most of that 29,000 is civilian. That included substantial numbers of fighters, there would be a much higher proportion of males aged 16 to 46 or so than there actually is. Um, uh, so therefore, I think that that number is overwhelmingly civilian. Um, but if we add in say 10,000 and we assume that most of the Hamas bodies are not recovered, um, so we're we're up to not 30,000 dead, but 40,000 dead, 10,000 of them Hamas, that means about a quarter um, so I would think 25, 30% of, of deaths being military deaths is probably in the right ballpark, but frankly, we don't know. And I don't think anyone knows. I, I mean, the irony is when Israel was complaining about the Gaza ministry of health number, it turns out that those are the numbers that the IDF uses internally too, or the Gaza ministry of, of health numbers, which have proven pretty accurate in every previous war in, in Gaza. So it's, it's uncertain, but that would be my my estimate, given what we have of the demographic distribution, unrecovered bodies, probable Hamas losses, and so forth. So on the reconstruction, one to four, one, one to four, one to four, one to four in urban warfare is is normal, or not? Um, oh, we we that that we, um, I would argue that it, that's that that is a critical question in which critics or defenders of Israeli military behavior get into major arguments. Because um, I mean, I mean, we, then, in but, other but, cases, in, in, in Mosul, for example, we don't it, have- it was, Yeah. It, well, we don't have, in, in, in Mosul, it was probably closer to 1.5 civilians to one, 10,000 civilians, maybe 10,000 Daesh. Yeah. So it's closer to 1.5. Mariupol, completely different numbers. Raqqa, where we actually do have reasonably good numbers, it was closer to one to one. You have to Israel. A couple of things we have to say is going. Israel has unparalleled control over airspace. I mean, it controls the lever of military force in a way that is extraordinarily unusual. It is capable of massive discrimination. Um, it has extraordinarily accurate intelligence, and one would expect Israel ought to be doing way better than one to four, right? If they're not the Russians in Mariupol, in which they're. They, they have no excuse because they're incompetent. Um, they they ought to be able to do a lot better than than 25, you know, 75 percent of the deaths. If you know that you're going to, to kill four innocent people, uh, including uh, women and children, if you know that and you still do it, you still well, target the, 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 the uh, best I mean, evidence of this. What is the border in the war crime, you know, because. Yeah. It, yeah. It, so, I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that this this falls into into war crimes and indeed crimes against humanity. I think the genocide debate is a more complex legal debate, but crimes against humanity. Absolutely. And we have some evidence. There was some very good reporting in the Israeli press or a small part of the Israeli press on IDF targeting in October. Uh, in which they talked about we are taking down prestige targets, meaning high rise buildings for political effect, something that used to require levels of permission. But now we just do it. They also said that they targeted the homes of every known Hamas member uh, early in the war. Uh, even though they would have known that they would have been on duty and not home, <laughs> right? Uh, so if you target the home of active military personnel during a war, you're almost certainly going to get spouses and kids and grandparents and what have you. You're almost certainly not going to get the combatant who's unlikely to be sitting in their home in the middle of the war. And we know that that was done, that they had data on where many Hamas members lived and they just dropped the bomb on everything. Um, so there's so clearly... They're targeting, and, and even the Biden administration, which has been extraordinarily supportive of Israel, started making more and more noises about the conduct of the military operation. Um, they didn't do enough about it, but certainly they started using words to indicate that they thought Israel was not conducting the, the campaign with the appropriate amount of discretion. Now, international law does allow you to kill civilians, but you have to show discrimination and targeting, and it has to be quote, proportional to the military advantage gained. And I don't think that Israel can make that case. I think also 
um, Israel's attitude to humanitarian assistance has clearly been a war crime. I, I mean, it would be the easiest thing in the world for Israel to facilitate humanitarian assistance. It's right there. <laughs> I mean, you can watch from the Israeli border the affected areas um, and to, you know, to limit the amount of humanitarian assistance going in to the amounts and the locations and the way in which it's going in to only be checking humanitarian aid convoys during business hours and not 24 hours a day. Um, I mean, the the impediments, um, those are very clearly, I think, war crimes because Israel could much more easily uh, uh, provide humanitarian assistance or facilitate humanitarian assistance than it's doing so. But I think that's both a policy decision uh, not to do so. And I think it's also much of the IDF is full of angry people who don't care um, because of October 7th, uh, may not have cared before October 7th, but don't care after October 7th. Finally, on the issue of reconstruction in Ukraine, Ukraine has a hinterland. Most of Ukraine is not occupied. Ukraine has a functioning government. Ukraine is a place you can bring things in. Um, that will not be true of Gaza. Um, some people may remember the severe constraints on cement that used to exist in Gaza, where Israel just would not bring, allow building materials in. That relaxed over time as part of Netanyahu's strategy of trying to co-opt Hamas. Um, and a lot of building materials leaked onto the open market, but I don't see Israel allowing cement or rebar or electrical wiring or irrigation pipes or water pipes back into the Gaza Strip for years to come. It's gonna look like, it's gonna be even more intense than the worst periods of the siege. And without that, you just actually can't do, in, in the absence of government at hinterland access, building materials, even if you have the money, and I'm not sure that we will have the money uh, because people don't want to subsidize the Israeli occupation right now. Um, even if you have the money, it would be very difficult. Um, if people wanted to spend that money right now, they could cover the shortfall in the UNRWA budget. And I don't see the Gulf galloping to cover the shortfall in the in the UNRWA budget, right? I mean, UNRWA is in the front line. It's Almost the vast majority of IDPs are in adjacent to or in the neighborhood of an UNRWA facility, which is often the center for aid distribution. Aid distribution is getting much harder in Gaza because there's been a massive breakdown in civil order in recent weeks. Um, aid convoys are attacked constantly by gangs, gangs and or by just hungry Gazans. So it, it's got very difficult to do humanitarian assistance in Gaza in the last few weeks. Um, but you know, UNRWA is absolutely critical in that. There's really virtually nothing that doesn't happen that doesn't have some connection to UNRWA, half of its budget disappeared. The agency can only function for a few more weeks. And I don't see people galloping forward to, to, to fill that shortfall, let alone the additional billion dollars it needs on top of its shortfall to continue current humanitarian operations. And that's leaving aside the terrible situation of Palestinians in the West Bank, Lebanon, and, and Syria as well. Well, before we conclude on that, on these pessimistic notes, of course, I just want to go back to to the uh, the figures, the uh, the casualties figures regarding Hamas. Uh, it's it's quite controversial, and uh, there are critiques, of course, of these these figures because what what happened is that uh, Israel has been considering all male uh, cons declared as dead by by. Um, that with the Ministry of Health of Hamas, they're declaring them as Hamas. So this is why we, we end up with the 10,000 figure. And that's basically uh, one third uh, or, or probably a quarter of the uh, 30,000 uh, uh, people that recovered, that the uncovered, uh, besides the recovered bodies. So the, the, the figures is, is, is quite controversial because it's, it's really hard to, uh, to believe that every single male that was um, declared that was Hamas. Um, there are a lot of um, discussion about this. Uh, otherwise, the, the entire uh, prospect that we discussed today goes back to occupation, illegal occupation, of course. So an occupation with Palestinians, and that's uh, the, the optimistic the scenario of occupation with Palestinians in the uh, southern parts of Gaza and a pessimistic scenario with occupation without the Palestinians um, forced out of their territory, of their land into Egypt. And that's the scenario, of course, that no one wishes. 
Um, but uh, we have, of course, to 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 discuss the um, the prospect of uh, a military campaign that has been described all over the world as acts of genocide or as a genocide, and has been considered by the International Court of Justice as a plausible genocide. And um, we will see how the, the coming days and weeks will develop. And we, we still wish for uh, a scenario that would take us away from both scenarios. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Brynan, for your generous time, for your um, sharing your expertise and your insight on this very difficult issue at difficult time. And thank you, uh, Professor Omar. And thank you for the uh, strategic um, as a unit for hosting this uh, talk. Uh, thank you all also, uh, our audience. And um, so we say goodbye for now and let's hope for the best for the people of Gaza. Thank you.